David H. Frakes, uh, PhD. I'm an assistant professor here at uh, Arizona State University, uh, jointly appointed in the schools of biological and health systems engineering and the uh, school of electrical computer and energy engineering. You know, the pathology that we deal with, cerebral aneurysms, those are uh, those affect approximately two to five percent of the population. Um, uh, it's unclear, uh, you know, exactly how many people have them because uh, oftentimes, in the, in the favorable cases, um, someone can go through life uh, having one and and not even know it uh, if it doesn't become problematic. When there is a problem, you know, when an aneurysm does develop and uh, sometimes eventually burst, uh, then the uh, the outcomes are, are, are usually uh, catastrophic. Uh, you know, the mortality rates are on the order of um, 50 percent in the first few days, uh, and uh, overall, um, cerebral aneurysms, ruptured cerebral aneurysms specifically, cause about 20,000 deaths each year in the in the United States. An aneurysm um, is a it's a it's a balloon-like uh, sac that forms off of the side of a blood vessel. You know, we think of our blood vessels as tubes, and if there's a weak point, then a, a balloon can come out of that tube um, and expand uh, out from the vessel where it shouldn't be. That's what an aneurysm is. Now what an aneurysm does when it bursts is it allows blood to, uh, to flow out of the cerebrovascular system, um, out of the blood vessels in the brain, and into the brain tissue itself where it's not supposed to be. The heart is a very strong muscle. So when we have the heart pumping blood out of the blood vessel and into brain tissue where it shouldn't be, uh, brain tissue of course being surrounded by the skull, which is an enclosed space, uh, the pressure there gets very high very quickly um, and, the, and the heart effectively pumps blood into the brain where it crushes the brain tissue, um, which causes you know, fatal catastrophic injury in, in most cases. There are a lot of uh, really amazing and, and um, extremely effective devices for treating these, uh, these vascular pathologies. The problem is that for the most part, we don't really understand what the specific effects are that these devices have. Um, oftentimes they work, but many times they don't. And the problem is we don't really understand why they don't work when they don't work. Uh, so what we do in my lab is we take these devices, we put them into models uh, of cerebral aneurysms that come from real people, um, and then we then find out exactly what the devices do in terms of altering fluid dynamics in the affected blood vessel. Um, with that information, we can understand specifically what each device does uh, and therefore plan for using it more effectively in the clinic. My name is Justin Ryan. I'm a graduate research associate here at Arizona State University in the Image Processing Applications Laboratory. On a daily basis, I run both computer and physical modeling aspect of the lab, and that uh, entails the creation of either blood vessels or even uh, cardiac structures in a computer form as well as a physical form. This uh, big initiative we're working on is part of the uh, cerebral vascular modeling uh, component. So what we need to do is we want to create uh, models from patient data of cerebral aneurysms. And we do this through a process that involves uh, many hospitals as collaborators, all the way to uh, rapid prototyping using solidscape equipment, to metal casting, and then finally uh, urethane or plastic casting. I'm Dr. Brie Roselle. I am a postdoctoral researcher here at the Image Processing Applications Lab. The major overall goal for us is actually to use the experimental methods to validate computational methods. The issue with these kind of things is that computational studies aren't validated in a way that we're very confident with what they're telling us. And so what we can do is use the information we get from the experimental studies because we know um, our validation techniques are good and that we have um, you know, carefully made sure that our flow is similar to what we would see in a patient. We know exactly what's happening in our experimental studies. We can use that to validate the computational studies. So the value of being able to, to print models and actually build um, anatomically accurate vascular geometries to test, uh, the ground truth that comes from that process is really invaluable in our research. The end product of our, of our physical 3D modeling stage is a, is a transparent block uh, wherein there is a, a lost core or a, a hollow portion of the model um, that is an exact replica um, of a cerebral aneurysm from a person. In order to, uh, to get to that end product, we, we start off by building the positive, the actual um, geometry from the patient. 
Um, and then we then mold another material around that so that we can create uh, a, a transparent block with the lost core por portion, with the hollow portion representing the blood vessel. So uh, rapid prototyping is how we get that first, that positive, before we go to the negative that is the flow model. The ability to you know, pull these geometries out and just send them to a printer, I mean, it seems like magic almost, but it's just the best way for us to be able to quickly make you know, a model of a patient's geometry. I, mean, I was giving a tour to high school students the other day and showing them the models, and they're just amazed that we can do it. This technology is outstanding, and it allows us to um, you know, really do things that we want to quickly and effectively. Uh, another thing that we're using 3D printing for is for creating uh, replicas of congenital heart defects for surgical planning. Uh, so we've, uh, we've initiated a project where um, instead of walking in and, uh, to an operation after looking at several images on a screen, a surgeon can walk into the operating room holding uh, you know, a real replica of a congenital heart defect um, that describes what they're going to see when they actually open a patient up and go to fix it. Uh, so this is another, uh, another instantiation of, of 3D prototyping having uh, just a really high value in medicine and bioengineering. Uh, it simply allows us to, uh, to express data in ways that were impossible 10 years ago. In the, both the near and, and midterm, I think that we're all going to be surprised by um, by the incredible number of places that 3D printing fits into both medicine and, uh, and medically oriented research. Uh, the truth is that we're only now um, starting to, to understand how useful it can be in all the different places it can fit. Um, because we've gotten very accustomed to using computer representations of things, and those have their advantage, there's no question. Uh, but at the same time, as humans, we're used to putting our hands on things. We're used to looking at things in the real 3D space that, that we experience. Uh, rapid prototyping allows us to, uh, to leverage the most natural of our skills in looking at objects uh, by creating just about anything in the form that we can uh, appreciate it most naturally. And our SolidScape machine is the, it's the, heart, it's the backbone of our modeling process. Uh, we use that to, uh, to build the cores, to build the blood vessel models that, uh, that we then um, translate into uh, transparent flow models for our experiments. So all of the ground truth data that's informing our simulations in the end, uh, it comes from these models that the, uh, that the SolidScape machine helps us build. For me personally, the, uh, the prospect of actually using math and science to improve quality of life uh, is, is the driving factor. Um, that's what excites me about research, it's what's drawn me to bioengineering. Uh, and to be able to use um, skills that I'm naturally interested in, um, in terms of mathematics, in terms of science, experimentation, simulation, um, things that I have a natural passion for, to be able to employ those and purpose those so as to uh, Im improve human quality of life uh, is, is the most compelling uh, uh, factor behind what I do.